as we get to the international break, I think it's probably a good time to look at what our expectations are, look at what other people's expectations are, look at how high we're being raised up in terms of, oh, where's the narrative going? Because I was at the Arsenal game yesterday. I was watching one of Liverpool's title rivals or top four rivals, whatever you want to call them, depending on what your expectations are, play a very different game to the game that I saw Liverpool play. And I saw City play a very different game to the game that I saw Liverpool play on the weekend. But I'm not, I guess I'm not the kind of fan that in the moment goes, we're always going to be better than these guys. But at the same time, I want to manage expectation the other way and say, Slot's not on an unprecedented start because Jurgen Klopp is the only manager in the Premier League era to better this run than the one that Arne Slot is on. I think we're on, uh, by this point in the season, we were on 31 points under Klopp in that unprecedented season that we had at that time. And we're on 28 right now because of the loss to uh, Nottingham Forest. What's interesting about it is the way that people are telling Liverpool's story. The way that YouTube is now, and don't get me wrong, like, I think we're all, it, because football's an observational game, we're all guilty of it. But the way that YouTube is now, it basically goes, Graben Butch had a good game. Nunez scored, so he must be good. And Salah scored, so he's an all-time great, but he's not as good as the greats that I like. Canate, still, uh, I don't know him, so I can't say he's good. Van Dijk, legend, Kelleher, number two, Andy Robertson, over, Trent, going, McAllister, Brighton, Soboslai, European player, Diaz, meant to be Mane, and Nunes, oh, he's chaos. And so all we get is the same carried over narratives from the previous era, and we forget that actually under Arne Slot, already a lot of things are changing. Even though people are saying the words, Liverpool are changing, they still, and this was something that was said to me by an Arsenal fan post Arsenal game as I was walking away from the field. Remember when you crumbled last year? You're still the same team. And I thought that was interesting because Liverpool didn't put a run like this together last year. And in fact, if Arsenal or City had put a run like this together this season, we would be saying, guess what guys, this is, title winning form. This is a form which shows that there is consistency, that there is game management, that there is a repeatable and adaptable system. All the things which in modern football tend to mean success are being shown out on the field for Liverpool at the moment. But at the same time, and again, there's every, you're going to get a bit bored of this. It's going to be, here's a good thing. But at the same time, we know that City are capable of putting runs together. Say they signed someone in January. They're currently apparently competing with Liverpool for Zubamendi in January, if Liverpool even still have Zubamendi as a target. Arsenal are very capable of putting something together. I watched Odegaard in the second half of that Arsenal-Chelsea game with my own eyes, running things, doing things that he wasn't doing in the first half because I think he was still getting his game back on but he was definitely having a massive impact on the game. And I think that will come in opening up other teams. They're not going to play Chelsea every week. And in fact, Arsenal have a lot of their very difficult games out the way. And Arsenal fans were very quick to remind me that Liverpool still have a lot of difficult games. By the way, something that I've been saying on this channel for ages and something that I've been met with, why are you being a downer about it? Just because we're looking at where Liverpool are going, just because we're looking at, you know, the, the, the run that Liverpool have next, the order in which Liverpool play games, which by the, every team has to look at the order in which they play games, it has a big impact on the way your season works. Doesn't mean that we're being downers. Doesn't mean, it just means what we're saying is, this is great. But the nature of modern football, the nature of the way that other fans work is that if we start to buy into our own thing, which is what's happening, which is what, I mean, they're trying to make us do that. They're trying to like, there's a sleight of hand going on here. It's going, you're top of the league. This one's, your, this one's yours to lose. But at the same time, the same videos end with, but it's too early to call. So I'm just saying, Liverpool fans, be careful. There are some traps out there, all right? And I mean like big traps. People set in like, you know, the leg eating ones, like the bear traps that basically come up and like, you know, sever your femur. What's this one? What's this one? Is that your femur? Femur. Federal Emergency Management Agency. Wasn't what I was going for. Uh, anyway, the point is, right? Yes, this is a really good team. And here's the weird thing. 
17 games, 15 wins, one draw, one loss. The draw was against Arsenal. The loss was against uh, Nottingham Forest. The wins come against big teams. Chelsea, AC Milan. I think the list goes on, but I just can't remember any, any other big teams in there. Manchester United, we will play again, but we'll play them in a very different form. All I'm saying is, Arnest Slot at the moment is not only playing against managing expectation, by the way, there's also this whole thing of like, hey, Liverpool's greatest era is about to start anyway, because remember when Bill Shankly left and then Bob Paisley took over? Well, Arnest Slot is Bob Paisley. Well, guess what? Arnest Slot was not in uh, Jurgen Klopp's backroom staff. Arne Slot was not in the boot room, as we call it at that time. And in fact, in that summer, Liverpool finds uh, find some quite prolific players for quite high prices. Like, I think now we're looking at... So they signed someone for 200k. And if you look at uh, uh, £100 back then, it was now £1,300 now. So add another zero. So it was a couple of million now, right? A couple of million is quite a lot of cash in olden day money. Anyway... Probably about, yeah. Anyway, the, the point is, we were spending money back then. We've not spent any money yet. Well, we spent a little bit of money on Mamadashvili, but that's a loan back out. And then Chiesa. You know what I'm saying? You get what I mean. These are very different narratives. These are very different things. What you could also paint another narrative that no one seems to be exploring right now, or at least very few people seem to be acknowledging, is that the backroom staff in Edwards, in Richard Hughes, in Everyone else who's moved out of the club, you know, Liverpool have moved on a lot of their analytics department. They've refreshed some of that. They're moving on ahead of the research. There's all sorts of people who've moved on, right? You could also say that Liverpool are setting themselves up for the next decade by having someone like Michael Edwards. And actually, if you look at all the managers that people want to sign right now, say Manchester United going for Amarim, Liverpool are questioning on him because he plays a back three, because he likes to play a very different style of football to the way that Liverpool want to play. Liverpool want to play a much more honest slot slash Jurgen Klopp. They want to have control and pace. And uh, Rumor Amarim is slightly more deliberate about his football, slightly slower about his football, and also slightly more reliant on certain players having excellent moments, say Gokeres, say some of their uh, wingers. While Liverpool have relied on some of those great things, I think what you can also say is there are, there are many repeatable, adaptable elements to Arne Slot's game. And those repeatable elements are not one-dimensional. I think on the clock, people kind of profiled Liverpool as like a one-dimensional, it's intensity. And so intensity was just like a coverall for counterattacking. They did it intensely. Pressing, they did it intensely. Scoring, they did a lot of it. And it all just became like a bit of a, oh, that's just Klopp. Slot has so many different assets to his game. You can talk about the defensive side of things. Liverpool have the best defence in the league. Yeah, we've pointed that out multiple times now. We've done that one. But for some weird reason, we don't seem to see... Uh, Kanate and Van Dijk getting the credit that they deserve. They were primed for that, by the way, in playing in such a, a defensive high line, in playing in such a different way, the way that not really Klopp wanted to play, but more like Pep Linders wanted them to play. And the same goes for the whole team. The adaptability that Linders had, the adaptability and the intensity that Klopp had has set them up for these small tweaks and leading to big changes in output under someone like Arne Slot, right? And the reason, from my perspective, that that is, is players were slightly more out on their own under someone like Klopp. It was very much like, dig yourself out of this hole. I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to put some players out on the field and we'll make a couple of, you know, key uh, insights for you guys. But broadly, you've got to dig yourself out. Slot is very much a manager who'll make these minor changes. And, you know, a couple of people have pointed out to me, they were like, well, I thought you were not great in the first half against Villa. In the second half, you came out and you were fantastic. That is very much characteristic of an honest slot team. They go in the first half, they're jabbing, they're jabbing, they're jab there's a terrible jab, by the way, but they're jabbing, they're jabbing, they're jabbing, and then bang, they land with another big right hook or whatever it is. Because honest slot is looking at where the patterns are emerging out in the field. It's why when Liverpool managed to counterattack and have counterattacked multiple times from defensive corners, you can pick multiple games where they've done this, the other manager goes, damn it. Because he knows that's, that's just a normal Liverpool thing. That's like, an, that's like a stock thing under Slot, under Klopp, under any Liverpool manager. That will be a thing. So if you lose there, which is like, hey guys, don't let Liverpool score from a counterattack on a goal, then the other aspects of your game are only going to get harder. Those things are multipliers of Liverpool's success in the game. 
Corners of Liverpool, of course, that's a fantastic thing. We want to have our own corners. But defensive corners, we counterattack them twice, if not three or four times on the weekend and found that there was just so much joy in counterattacking Villa. We weren't the first team to do that. We're also not the last team to counterattack from a goal. But we were not, this isn't the first time we did it either. Managers know if you get counterattacked by Liverpool on any of these areas, so free kick, even if it's just that they pick it up deep and then suddenly there's just runners going. You saw Van Dijk just went, boom, ball down. He knows there's going to be someone in that slot. They know there's going to be someone in the next slot and they know exactly where the ball's going to go. These are all training things that Liverpool as a squad have been primed for for years. All of this, and I mean all of this, is tapered by the fact that Liverpool, despite wanting to have some stability at the club, wanting people to re-sign contracts, wanting things to become more stable, are currently in a state of flux with three, if not a few more of their bigger players. They've re-signed Kwanzaa. They're looking at, the, obviously there's the Canate situation going on where hopefully he will stay for a long time at Liverpool. There's the Van Dijk, Salah, and obviously Trent situation. There's Mamed Ashvili sitting there as a goalkeeper that Liverpool want to bring in. Who knows what's going to happen to Alisson at some point. It'd be very interesting to see whether because Liverpool signed Mamed Ashvili, whether if we were to float, I mean, I know Alisson's saying he wants to stay and that's fantastic. I very much want to keep Alisson. I love him as a goalkeeper. Like genuinely, he's probably my favorite Liverpool goalkeeper ever, at least of my lifetime. You know, there's probably other goalkeepers that I've not watched is what I'm saying. But of my lifetime, he's my favorite goalkeeper. And I've had a lot of goalkeepers I've liked. You know, we're going back to Sander Vesterveld after, I didn't really like David James as a goalkeeper for Liverpool. But you get my point, like Vesterveld into, I wasn't really a massive Dudek guy. Like I liked him in the Champions League final, but that was kind of like, there's your iconic moment. Let's move on. And then Pepe Reina came in. He obviously kept the golden glove for those three seasons. Liverpool have had some pretty good goalkeepers in that time, but also pretty just pretty good defensive units. Like it shows. By the way, another thing to note, a lot of people are talking about uh, the, the whole, oh, it was Shankly that went to Paisley. There is much more of equivalency here that goes Gerard Houllier into Benitez, where Gerard Houllier had made like, you know, a Houllier-esque team. Not that it was a fantastic side. We had a couple of guys in there uh, who were not fantastic players, but, you know, that's almost by the by. He built a side that squad-wise, there was an element, like if a manager was to come in and capitalize on that, that would be great. But they, like, Julier just, it, it had kind of gone, the, the moment had passed, it had sort of gone past him. And I'm not saying the moment had passed Klopp, and I'm not saying that Slot is like Benitez, but there is an equivalency in there that he comes in and picks up a team that does have, it, it does have an identity. It does have a spine. And if someone can shape it into something, which he has so far, then there is a run in there. Benitez won off the back of a good Julier time, like, or a good Julier build, with a couple of tweaks. When I say tweaks, I mean like he completely changed them to be a much more defensive team. Julier was a lot more Danny Murphy-esque. But Benitez came in and tweaked that team and added a couple of his own guys, but we knew that there was broadly like, right, you're good. I know it's ironic to say that considering that Igor Bishkan, Jimmy Traore, Salif Diaw, the list goes on, we're in that team, right? But you get my point. Anyway, there is, now an, there is now a time where Liverpool are entering flux. There are, I was kind of listing them out in my mind yesterday on the tube back from the Arsenal game, multiple things that could trip Liverpool up and how Liverpool manage those things and how we react as a fan base is very key to that. And I, I really want to be intentional about this. First of all, Say Liverpool do sign someone in January. Say it's Zubamendi. It could be another centre-back as well. We didn't spend any money in the last transfer window. So, hey, who knows what's going to come in this and the next transfer window. We, you know, we spent a minimal amount on Chiesa and Mamed Ashley, but you get my point. And we did sell a lot of players in that period. For decent profit, I will add. Anyway, Van Dijk resigns. I'm 50-50 on where we're at with Salah, but I'll, you know, I'll... I'll hear you either way as to whether he re-signs or not. I think that is then all how we manage Trent moving to Real Madrid. We need to show there is a new way that we move the ball forward. There is a new level of creativity. There is a new emphasis in the team, similar to when Klopp moved on Coutinho, obviously for a huge amount of cash. And we went, right, the emphasis is now not the creative midfield, but the workhorse midfield. The emphasis is now not 
Coutinho moving the ball forward, but Van Dijk, obviously we bought Van Dijk on the back of that. Alisson, obviously we bought Alisson on the back of that money. The people immediately in front of that, Genie Wijnaldum, Fabinho, Henderson, those three guys are going to work as a unit to enable the people immediately ahead of them. I think we'll see a shift if someone like Trent does leave because Trent wants to play more like central midfield slash a roaming role. He's been playing a much more right back style role in the last few games. Credit to Bradley, by the way, for understudying him. I think that what we will see is a shift in the emphasis in the team. The concern, I guess, and the thing that I think we're looking at passing the torch on is where the leadership comes from if you move on two of your three big tone setters, but also leaders within the side. Salah being an arm around many players' shoulders in the team. Trent being a Gerrard-esque kind of, I'll do this, you come up to my level style player. And Virgil van Dijk being a silent but also, I mean, I suppose silent in the sense that he sets a trend, but verbal in the sense that what he says goes in the dressing room type leader. All those are three very different archetypes of leader, and it's very important to have different styles of leader within the squad. We, we transitioned from a different leadership idea before, someone like Henderson, who'd been the captain of the team even before Klopp had arrived, and then Milner, obviously, that's a really great signing in the first place, but, you know, again, a very vocal leader, We've now transitioned to a different style of leadership. Alison, we, I guess we can count him as, again, someone like a trendsetter in the dressing room, someone who's very calm, someone who other people feel they can rely on. His injuries really don't help us, but you get my point. The same goes for, I mean, I suppose you could say there are other leaders in the side, such as McAllister. He's now entered that uh, leadership group. Andy Robertson has always been a leader in terms of I'm going to set a tone here. I'm going to go out there and do things that you don't want to do so you can do your job in the sense of I'm going to foul Messi. I'm going to make it awkward for PSG. That's what Andy Robertson's job is. And that, these are all tones that I think we're not acknowledging. It's like a choir singing out there for Liverpool. They have to have different notes that these people are setting. You can't all be singing the same note and you can't all want to sing the same note, right? And that's kind of my point here. What we have is... I think a transitional period we're about to enter that we thought would happen when Klopp left, but is actually going to happen when Van Dijk, Salah, or Trent, or two of the three, or one of the three move on. And how we react to that as a fan base, and I've spoken about this now, you know, we're learning how to support a slot side. I've been saying that for quite a while. And how we react to that as a fan base is very key. There will be a very big clickbaity segment of the internet that goes, big names leaving means... Uh, change and a lack of success. It happened with Mane when we were going to replace him with Diaz. It took time for Diaz to come good. We then bought Gakpo. Again, it took time for Gakpo, for Gakpo to come good, possibly, poss possibly, partially because of profiling, partially because I think Slot plays a different kind of um, profiling game to the one that Linders and Klopp played. And that, I think, has played a big part in Liverpool improving and consolidating what were good transfer wins anyway. And also why Liverpool, their policy at this point is not move on anyone, move on the people we really want. That is really key, I think, in this. Boy, this would be good as a podcast, wouldn't it? Much better if you have someone to bounce off. I'm just saying. Anyway, the point goes, this is a period of transition. And I think that's what makes me feel slightly unsure or less likely to commit to we're going to win the league. But I still want to be excited about it. And I am still excited. I watched Arsenal fans yesterday going, oh, what are we doing this for? I watched Chelsea fans going, oh, why did he lose the ball there? I don't feel that way about our team. I feel the same about Manchester United. Play, people wince when certain players get the ball. The same at City right now is it's like, it's the same at City in the sense that they aren't always confident when players are on the ball. It's not the same. They don't react the same as Arsenal, Manchester United and Chelsea. They react as in, whoa, why did we just mess that up? Or like, oh, right, yeah, like we don't have Rodri. And that's my final, I guess, big flag or big concern. Losing one of the midfield players, despite retaining Endo, despite having Tyler Morton, despite having Harvey Elliott coming back, Chiesa necessarily getting fit, and Jota allegedly coming back at some point in November, partially post, uh, possibly post-international break. 
we've shown we can get through those injury periods because I think Slot is a very adaptable manager who's able to adapt and show, hey, like, why did, like even on the weekend, it was kind of like, hey, uh, actually, it wasn't, it, it, was in, it was the week before that Diaz played through the middle. Uh, Nunez now plays through the middle on the weekend. That's two very different profiles of player who are playing through the middle. One is a more like false 90 type. Nunez is a more busy type striker. What he's showing is he can profile players in multiple different positions and rotate them in multiple different places. I think Nunez is best as a striker. I think what we're seeing is Diaz being asked to play centrally, Gakpo playing off the left and Salah playing on the other side offers such a different style to play against for the opposition that it's very difficult to judge where that goes. I, there won't be many managers who've seen Diaz playing through the middle and can say, when he does this, do this. And then as soon as you bring another player on or as soon as you have Gakpo coming off the left or Gakpo rotating into the center and Luis Diaz going out wide, everyone's lost everyone in that point. So Slot is having fun playing right now. And I, I really appreciate that. I'm really enjoying that style. I'm really enjoying that the shape shifting, I called it a Rubik's Cube because you're always shifting the sides around, but are we working out the Rubik's Cube or are we the Rubik's Cube? I guess it goes both ways. You're trying to work out the opposition, move them around. But we're moving opposition teams around so well in, an ag in a different way to the way that City do. So we pass, we pass, we pass. It, it, you know, City pass, City pass, City pass, it creates a gap. With Liverpool, there was this multiple gaps being created. First of all, Curtis Jones drops a little deep on the weekend, receives the ball. His man can't go with him. Fantastic. There's been space created there. That's not unusual in football. But Diaz is then triggered and suddenly he's through the middle and boom, Curtis Jones is playing that ball. That seems like something that's been done in training. That seems like something that's been pre-agreed. That is something which shows Diaz was not necessarily a central player for Liverpool before. He's suddenly becoming a central player. Curtis Jones was used to playing off the left, but now Curtis Jones is playing more centrally. Suddenly he's dropping a little deeper, suddenly the ball is through. A reprofiling of players. I was encouraged on the weekend to not get overly hyped by Curtis Jones. Why not? Like, I can't win in these videos at the moment. If I'm profiling and hyping a player, I get told, calm down, there's like 50 Curtis Joneses in Barcelona's academy. And if I don't hype them in another video, I get told, why are you being so negative? So you can't win. I, I, I'm not saying that's me necessarily. I'm just saying we can't win either way. Because if Liverpool say, hey, we're going to win the league, everyone goes, look at them, they're arrogant. And if we go, hey, calm down, guys. Arsenal have still got a lot of very straightforward games to go. They've played a lot of their difficult games up top in the season, meaning that they're stacking good points later on in the season. None, we can't win. We can't win on any of those things. But what I'm saying is don't buy into, if you win the first 17 games of your season, then the rest of them are going to follow like that. There will be injuries. Hopefully not, you know, touch wood, inshallah. You can't mix those two things. I shouldn't have done that. I'm sorry. I didn't mean to mix those two things. That's uh, the conflict that goes on. Culture and everything else. Anyway, the point is... <laughs> The point is, there is a bit of a conflict at the moment within this Liverpool fan base as to how we judge the team. I think we can continue to go under the radar, even though we very much appear on other people's radars. Because guess what? Other people have to prioritize what it is they think is the threat. And here's the great thing about it. For years now, Michael Edwards, and now by proxy, Richard Hughes, have profiled people that go, under the radar. Bournemouth, Michael Edwards, Liverpool, heading up a research team, bringing in new ways of thinking, bringing in new models, bringing in new ideas. That means that inherently he goes against the grain while everyone else is zigging, he's zagging. While everyone else is zagging, he's zigging. That's the point. It makes it difficult for us as a fan base to follow because while you're zigging, you can't say, I'm zigging because everyone else is zagging. That's not the way it works. That's like, if you've got some spies in a country, the government coming out and going, yeah, by the way, there's some spies in that country. Give us some credit for it. Inherently, Liverpool cannot come out and say, give us some credit for that. Because it's just, it's not the way it works. We can as a fan base. And by the way, the hilarious thing and the thing that I really enjoy is other people, when I break even basic tactics down, saying, what are you giving it away for? I'm like, you think if I, can, if I can spot this, any other Premier League manager has known this two years ago? I'm just saying. 
Anyway, I really appreciate knowing where you guys are at, mentally, physically, all those kind of things. And we'll go from there. There are some exciting things coming in the Premier League. Ruben Amarim. Pep Guardiola fixing City. Arsenal getting Odegaard back. What's our next thing? Let me know in the comments below. What's our next thing? This is going to be on a podcast feed as well. Yeah, I think I'm going to upload this as a podcast because guess what? That was a 25-minute rant. Was that a rant? Was that a monologue? It's all about framing, isn't it, guys? Anyway, I will chat to you on the other side. Hope you're having a good day. Hope you're enjoying the international break already. <laughs> Sorry, I just couldn't get through that. I will see you on the flip side. Much love. Bye.